Now, let me introduce you to um, our presenter today, Mr. Adam Hill. Adam is a licensed customs broker, a certified customs specialist, certified export specialist, and an MBA. Adam sits on the Trade Support Network with U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Um, we are pleased to have Adam as our Vice President of Operations for both Scarborough International and Scarborough de Mexico. Um, and I'm also glad to call Adam a friend. So Adam, if you wouldn't mind. Oh, thanks, Kevin. Um, like Kevin said, we're going to take a few minutes and just go through a quick um, little synopsis on what is an FTZ, tell you a little bit um, about them, um, and then open the rest up for questions at the end. Um, so most people don't even know what an FTZ is, but you know, a foreign trade zone is inside of the United States. It's a designated location. Um, you can kind of think of it as um, a so it's kind of like an area inside of the United States that is designated as what I will call almost foreign soil. So things that are inside the foreign trade zone haven't entered the commerce of the United States yet, according to the customs laws. So that allows you to do things inside of a foreign trade zone that without actually clearing customs that you normally couldn't do. So for example, if you import something, you know, that and you want to do some quality control on it, you would have to clear that product before you could ever do QC on it. Um, inside of a foreign trade zone, you can actually do that QC work, look at the product, make sure it's right, before you then go ahead and clear through customs. So that's just one small thing um, that you can do. Um, so with that, you do have to activate a foreign trade zone. Um, the process is not overly uh, complicated, um, but it is detailed. Um, we have um, actually the president of the Kansas City Foreign Trade Zone on the call today, Mr. Al Figley. Um, he, he won't be doing any uh, presentation, but he uh, is available for phone calls or emails um, after this, and we can get you his contact information if anybody would like it specifically here for the Kansas City market. So in order to activate, what do you need to do? Um, it is a written application. Um, you need to make sure we have a description of the zone sites, any kinds of operations you're going to do inside of that zone, whether it be manufacturing, um, those in the textile world, maybe it's decorating and, you know, it could be quality control. It could be simply, it could be storage for deferment of duties. It could be something that you, Im that you import that is ultimately destined for another country. So you could bring it in. Um, you need a statement of the general character of the merchandise to be admitted. A blueprint of the area, and that is approved by the Foreign Trade Zone Board to be activated. Um, it does need to show all the measurements um, and then any openings to the building. Um, one thing I always like to note here is, is as you're going through this process, um, we always advise folks to make sure that they include their parking lots as part of their foreign trade zone. Um, the reason for that is, is when you have overflow, we have a lot of clients that will then take cargo put it, you know, rent a trailer, take that cargo, and then move it out into their parking lot just in the stored trailer um, during their overflow time. The problem is, is if your building is a foreign trade zone and then that cargo leaves those four walls in, in your um, parking lot, it's not also part of your zone, you've just removed that product from the foreign trade zone. Um, so it's, it, it's a pretty small detail, but it's something that's obviously very important. Um, you also need to put together a procedures manual detailing your inventory control processes, your record keeping, um, and, then, and then any activities that are going on inside of that zone. And then finally, you, need, you do need the written concurrence of the grantee um, when you actually apply for activation, who is the person who actually kind of runs that zone um, or from the administrative side. So... Prior to what's called the alternative site framework, um, a general pur purpose zone typically took four to six months. Um, and that's for something that's pretty basic, um, talking about maybe just product in and out, maybe some export, some deferment, but not a lot of manufacturing, um, something very simple. The more detailed, you know, anywhere from eight to 14 months. With the new alternative site framework, that that times you know that time frame has drastically reduced down to 45 to 60 days. Um, it also reduces attorneys' fees for those of you who go the route and use an attorney. Um, one thing I will say about that 45 to 60 days, though, 
is don't assume that you can start on day one and be done by day 60. There's definitely a good amount of work that leads into that 45 to 60 day process um, where you're actually going through the activation process itself, creating the manuals, getting all your diagrams. Um, there are certain insurances that have to be carried, things of that nature. So there is a little bit of confusion in the marketplace in general about there's something called a bonded warehouse and then there's something called a foreign trade zone. And so the next couple of slides, we're going to talk a little bit about what is the difference um, in all the way from entry down to what you can do inside the zone. So, so we start at the top, just a basic customs entry. So in order to get a product into a bonded warehouse, you actually have to file a customs entry, which means that unless you're a self filer, you need to hire a customs broker. Inside of a foreign trade zone, there is no actual customs entry. Um, the form itself is called a 214, um, and, and there is a lot less data required on that. We have a lot of customers that do that themselves. Um, we handle that process for customers as well. Um, a lot of it depends on your own internal processes and what you would prefer to take on. Um, the, the next step down, what is allowed inside of those? So in a bonded warehouse, you can only put foreign goods. In a foreign trade zone, you can put both foreign and domestic goods. And you might not think that's a big deal, but if you kind of think through that, if you're going to manufacture something, you probably have both. You have product that came from Asia, from Mexico, from Europe, you know, plus you have product that came from down the street. You know, maybe someone in Cleveland, Ohio provides something to you, and then someone from Dallas, Texas provides something to you. So with that, you can manufacture inside of that zone, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, and take advantage of some potential duty savings there. So speaking of duties, when you put goods into a bonded warehouse, um, you don't have to pay duties. But when you take them back out, you have to pay the customs duties. For a foreign trade zone, the difference is, is that they only have to be paid when they're entered into the commerce of the United States for consumption. So if you're going to manufacture something and then ship it back out of the country, you never had to pay customs duties on that product. If you imported things that you're just storing for inventory and that inventory got sold to Canada, you never had to pay customs duty on that product. So that's a huge difference um, between the two of them. Um, this is something that's, that is very interesting is that there's an inventory tax. Um, a lot of you might not be aware of it, but your finance people certainly are. Um, inside of a bonded warehouse, um, all goods are taxed. Inside of a foreign trade zone, those goods are still considered foreign. So there's a reduction in your inventory tax because the amount of money that is, that is cost to basically uh, landed for that product now gets removed from that calculation, and so there's an inventory tax savings as well. Uh, the, and then the, the next difference is the storage period. So inside of a bonded warehouse, you can only have goods in there for five years. I know that doesn't seem like a big deal, like I don't have any inventory that sits longer than five years, but yes, you do. Um, lots of people do, lots of people have, have inventory that, that sits there for, for a long time. Um, inside of a foreign trade zone, it's unlimited. The other interesting thing about that in the unlimited thing is you can take advantage of that foreign trade zone even to import machines. Maybe you, the machine that you need to make your product comes from Germany. You know, machines are tend to be dutiable in that 3% range. Um, if you import that product and you're paying 3% on a million dollars, that gets to be expensive fast. If you can put that into a foreign trade zone and use it inside of that zone, you never had to pay customs duties on that item. And that's something that people don't often think about when they're looking at what are some of the advantages of the zone itself. The other advantage here um, with that is product that maybe during your manufacturing processes that um, becomes waste, product that doesn't meet quality, those items never have to be entered into the commerce, so therefore you don't have to pay customs duties on them, which is a big additional savings as well if something gets scrapped. Um, the control of the goods. This is something that most people also don't realize is that customs is the one in control of the goods inside of a bonded warehouse. Um, any requests must be made to CBP to do anything before you can do anything to those goods. So if you want to open a box, 
of your own cargo in your own bonded warehouse, you have to file a manipulation with US Customs in order before you can go open that box. Inside of a foreign trade zone, as long as that was part of the original application of things that you are wanting to do and it's already been approved, then you can pretty much do what you want inside of the zone. Um, there's obviously some rules and, and regs that govern that, but for the most part, um, any normal business activity can be done inside of the zone without having to go to customs and ask them to let you do something. Um, we talked a little bit about domestic goods already. Um, permitted activity, you know, we've talked about it, you know, in the bond and warehouse, you can do three things. You can clean, repack, and sort. But the rest of that is under CBP supervision. Inside of an FTZ, cleaned, packed, sorted, destroyed, graded, labeled, assembled, manufactured, exhibited, commingled with other freight, and none of that is under the customs purview until that product leaves that foreign trade zone into the commerce of the United States. Um, manufacturing, just in general, you can do that in a zone and you can't. The waste, we just talked about that as well. So really quick, um, we wanted to show you this, and I know we have um, people logged on from all over the country, but here's just an example of Kansas City's foreign trade zone um, activity between the Kansas and Missouri state line. So everything that you see with the red flag there is a current foreign, is currently activated as part of a zone inside of Kansas City. So we have stuff going, you know, about an hour west of the city up to about an hour and a half north, northeast of the city. Um, Scarborough's in the process of becoming one of these small flags on here as well as um, our operations will also be a foreign trade zone. And I think there could be some benefit for a lot of not only our current clients, but, but other clients in, you know, in the area that have overflow. Um, you can kind of see why Kansas City is important to us. Um, because of how close we are to so many major cities. We're basically two to three days from any point in the country, um, which is, a, from a domestic perspective, is a very nice spot to be. So, like I said, this is just an example. So, you know, and Kansas City is not the largest international trade market. So, if we get into some of the larger cities, there are some more foreign trade zone opportunities that exist inside of them. Talk a little bit about foreign trade zones and, and there's really there's four types of merchandise that can go in so um, this is all about how can you create duty savings for your company so there are things so a lot of product goes in is what's called non-privileged foreign what that means is that when that product finally leaves the zone that at the duty rate when that happens that is when it is assessed there's also what's called privileged foreign which is duty is assessed as the cargo enters the zone and it retains that duty rate. So we can maybe use something like anti-dumping. You know, you might have product that you want to bring in because you know that there's an anti-dumping rate coming out, getting ready to be 200% on something. You can bring it in as privileged foreign when the duty rate is still only 5% and hold that rate through. So that is another big advantage. Um, zone restricted cargo that cargo has to either be exported or destroyed. Um, we see this a lot and there are some pharmaceuticals that aren't allowed to come into the country. Um, there are certain arms and firearms that aren't allowed to be imported, um, but they can come into a zone, things can be done, and then they can leave the country or be destroyed. And then obviously you have domestic product and that can also enter the zone like we talked about in order to marry up with some of that other foreign product that you're bringing in and then when you take it out you take it all out as a kit a tractor a car I'm anything like that so I kind of want to walk you through what the process looks like um, we have the old paper process um, which looks a little bit intimidating and so just to give you an idea this is how it would look for Kansas City you can apply this to any other foreign trade zone so cargo moves in bond from Los Angeles, New York, into the port of Kansas City. We then have to send the 214 to the zone, and the zone has to say, yes, I'm willing to accept this. Then I send that same 214, this is a piece of paper, down to Customs, and Customs says, yes, you can move that cargo into the zone. 
Then when the trucker goes to pick that up, he also signs the 214 stating that he understands this is bonded cargo. Then once it gets into the zone, the 214 is signed by the zone operator saying, yes, we got everything. So before we're done, we have about six signatures on here, um, a lot of back and forth. So that is something that with the new electronic process, which is what's called E214, removes a lot of that headache. Um, it can all be done electronically now. There is no more paper moving back and forth. The other benefit is what's called direct delivery. So direct delivery means that in bonds, which were previously cut to the port of Kansas City, can now actually be, be cut directly into your foreign trade zone. There's some benefit there as well from a timing aspect from cargo can actually arrive into your zone and you can unload it prior to the 214 ever being finished. Now the window's tight, but there is some time there where previously you would have had to make sure cargo was cleared, you had to get pickup numbers, and go through this whole process in order to get that container to move from the rail yard to your zone. With direct delivery, you can skip all of those steps, um, which is also a big time saver. A lot of people say it saves them two to three days alone just in direct delivery from going the old paper route. Talk a little bit about the manufacturing opportunities and the duty savings um, that can be created in, inside of a foreign trade zone. So here's the scenario. We have a vacuum manufacturer that imports motors for final assembly in the, in the United States. Motors, as, as they come in, are dutiable at 4%. So that manufacturer, though, wants to manufacture their, their vacuums in the USA, but it's just too expensive. They can't get that motor at a good enough rate here in the U.S. in order to do that. But if they create a foreign trade zone, they can import that motor, not pay the duties on it. They can then assemble that vacuum and manufacture that vacuum from a motor here and then products, you know, maybe there's some products from down the street, something else from China. And then when that product leaves the zone, it's no longer a motor, it's a full vacuum. And vacuums are dutiable at 0%. So what you did is you did all of that work in the United States. So you can claim your product was at a minimum assembled here, potentially made here, and you're, you're taking multiple, you know, multiple duty percentage equations out of you know, your, your whole sales price because you went from paying 4% and you just added 4% to the bottom line just because you didn't pay customs duties on that vacuum alone. And this exists in a lot of industries. Most of the auto manufacturers are this way as well because cars are entire cars are dutiable at lower rates than most of the parts that are imported for cars. That's why a lot of the auto manufacturers are all foreign trade zones. Also allows them to export cars without having to pay customs duties on them ever. So a couple of words of caution here, and we're getting here real close to where we're just going to go into the question session is one of them is make sure you know your business. Um, there are FTZ consultants out there that will go down this following scenario. So you're an importer and you file a thousand entries annually and every one of those entries, they're going to make an assumption uh, that you paid $485 in merchandise processing fee, which is the maximum amount you can pay. Then they're going to tell you that inside of a foreign trade zone, you only have to file one customs entry a week. So that took that 1,000 entries all the way down to 52 entries. Well, that same $485 max for merchandise processing fee applies, so now you're only going to spend $25,220. So your, your savings off, off the bat is $460,000. We have seen this multiple times, and the reason I say know your business is because most of you never hit the $485 max in the first place. So. A great example is we had a client um, go through this process and they came to us after the fact and they said, we have pitched this, you know, and, and there's a big savings there. And we ran the numbers and we said, it doesn't make sense to us because they were only spending about $30,000 a year in MPF already. And they're getting ready to spend $25,000. So it took a $400,000 savings down to $5,000. And at that point, it's not worth it. So... Be wary of that pitch because that is how they're going to come in. That is how they're going to turn the heads of your upper management because anybody that sees almost half a million dollars in savings is going to pursue an opportunity. Um, a couple of things also to note inside of that is 
Is your receiving process robust enough to handle this? Your inventory has to be impeccable. Um, the reason for that is things that leave a foreign trade zone that didn't actually get cleared, um, that's a felony. So we've even seen people get into the foreign trade zone business to present theft from their own facilities. Because now it might, you know, maybe someone's been walking out with a hand tool or something like that and the tool might only cost $20 and they don't think it's a big deal. If they walk out with that same $20 tool out of a foreign trade zone, they have just committed a felony. So that's a big de um, uh, determinant to actually moving product out of that foreign trade zone that shouldn't have ever been. Um, do you need new software? You know, there is a lot more um, layers that go into this now. FIFO becomes very important, assuming that's your inventory um, controls and it, you know, customs, and you have to then report back on this every year and you have to be able to prove that stuff that came in was received and where it went and then stuff left. And, you know, did, did that, did those items enter the commerce of the US? Did those items leave the country? Were they destroyed? And so you have to be able to tie those back down to each one of your individual units that you import. Um, and then finally, we just talked about it, is how accurate is your inventory? Maybe you receive your product really well, but you know people tend to take things. The sales guys always screw this up because <laughs> they want to come in and they think that there's a sample and they're used to walking into a warehouse and you know they might open a box, grab four samples and leave. They can't do that inside of a foreign trade zone. So those are some of the controls that have to be in place before we can even start down this path of are you interested in becoming one. Um, my assumption is if you're going to want to do this, it's going to take you six months to a year to go through this process, set yourself up, and make sure you have the processes in place in order to actually do this. So with that, um, questions have been coming in, and I'm gonna let Kevin start to kind of filter through what we've seen um, and talk to you guys a little bit more and answer some questions.